Are all of our community members here? Just promoted Amy Johnson. Okay, that's who I was looking for. Okay, all right, welcome to budget 2024. I'm gonna to call today's meeting to order. Will 20, we call the roll? 25. 2025, that is correct. <clears throat> is for Udata? Um, I apologize if I butcher this name. Budget committee member Satsmari. Here. Thank you. Uh, budget committee member Payne. Present. Thank you. Budget committee member Newman. Here. Budget committee member Johnson. Here. Committee member Hanway. Here. Budget committee member Campbell. Budget committee member Beatty. Here. Budget committee member Tivnon. Here. Budget committee member T Teeter. Here. Budget committee member Kimmy. Here. Budget committee member Hassan. Here. Budget committee member Hartmayor Prig. Here. Budget committee member Duggar. Here. So I'm showing Campbell, Johnson, and Udata as absent. Is that correct? Okay. Johnson is here. Amy Johnson. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the second name. Amy Johnson is here. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, our next order of business is to elect the chair and the vice chair. And I'm hoping that Mr. Zatzmary and Ms. Johnson would agree to serve as the chair and vice chair again. Okay. Sure. Are the Yes. Sh 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 sure, that is like <laughs> a resound vote of confidence. Uh, but I figure you got your, got your uh, ready to go again for a second year and, and can keep going with that. Is there anyone else that would want to be considered for the role or should I make a motion to just approve uh, the chair and vice chair position? No one rushing to the chat box. So I'd like to make a motion that we approve Dave to serve as the chair and Amy to serve as the vice chair. I'll second. second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion on tonight's motion? See none. Well, there were, do we need to do another roll call? Can we just do like a hands? Jessica, do you have a preference for a roll? The best thing to do, unfortunately, is a roll call vote because it's very difficult to track it on video. So okay. well, legally, I know it's not easy. In all right. Let's do it again. Will the recorder call the roll? Budget committee member Duggar? Yes. Hartmeyer Prig? Yes. Hassan? Yes. Amy? Yes. Peter? Yes. Tivdon? Yes. Beatty? Yes. Hanway? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Newman? Yes. Payne? Yes. Satsmari? Yes. And I still have Campbell and Udata as absent, correct? Uh, I would like to uh, note that they are in the attendee list and we are attempting to promote the two of them right now. Okay. For the vote, I have to put yes, no, absent. absent. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chair, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, the next agenda item is public input. Um, do we have any members of the public who want to input uh, and give their thoughts on the budget? Uh, Chair, we have a David Anderson who would like to address the budget committee. Okay, and, and I think we have a time limit. Isn't that correct, Susan? Y yes, Jessica will cue that up. Two minutes. Okay, uh, David, you're on. You're on the floor here. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, uh, my name is David Anderson. I'm one of the owners of Syndicate Wine Bar down here in historic downtown Beaverton. 
I'm also a member of the Beaverton Area Chamber of Commerce. I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts tonight regarding the budget, but first I just wanted to say I did watch the city council meeting previously and that's very difficult what you just went through talking about your compensation and everything and I just wanted to share my thoughts that you were all very professional and that's a, a difficult thing to do so I just respect how you handled that. Um, as a member of the Beaverton Chamber, I just wanted to share that you know I've lived in this town for 25 years. The current way that the chamber is running is great. I've never seen such a vibrant and more engaged Chamber of Commerce in all the years I've been in Beaverton. Uh, they've done a lot to unify the business district throughout all of the city. Uh, they've also done quite a bit of advocacy for this historic district that I, I work in. Um, I understand that there are some considerations with uh, respect to reductions in the budget for the chamber, and I just wanted to voice my support. If you can at all, um, you know, not pull funding from the chamber in any way, that would be great. I uh, would really appreciate it. I don't, I don't think that there's, um, that, you know, it's, it's a difficult time for everybody, I understand. Um, there are some other organizations in town like the BDA and OSC. I, I don't really want to comment on them, but I will just say that the value of what the Beaverton Area Chamber of Commerce is providing for the city is uh, really important. So that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you so much, David, for your thoughts. Um, any other members of the public who would like to give their ideas to us? Anyone else? I do not see any more hands up. Okay, if if not, let's go to the next agenda item, which is the approval of minutes from May 9th, 2023 and May 23rd, 2023. Um, does anyone, anyone want to make a motion to approve them? I can make a motion, motion to approve the minutes from May 9th, 2023 and May 23rd, 2023. I'll second that motion. Okay, and the roll? Councillor Duggar? <clears throat> yes. Sorry, Budget Committee Duggar. Uh, Hartmeyer Prig? Yes. Hassan? Yes. Jimmy? Yes. Peter? Yes. Hibnon? Yes. Beatty? Yes. Campbell? H Hanway? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Newman? Yes. Dean? Yes. Thank you. Zatsmari? Yes. Udapa? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you all. Um, now the next agenda item are the opening comments uh, from Mayor Beatty on the fiscal budget year 2024-25. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, tonight, we're going to be discussing our budget for the upcoming fiscal year. The budget that we are currently developing will help lay a foundation for stable and effective government. Stability here means that we can consistently deliver the services our communities rely on without the disruption of financial uncertainty. A solvent government is the backbone of our city operations. It ensures that every department can function effectively and efficiently, allowing us to do things right today as we plan for tomorrow. Our collective vision for the city is clear and compelling. The council has spent the last three years working in tandem together to move forward a vision for our community to make sure that our goals are representative of not just uh, those that live here, but those that work here as well. We have had hard conversations to get to this point. This year's budget is a little bit easier than last year's budget. I want to commend the city manager uh, for her hard work. I mean, I know she was in the office till 8.30 last night, uh, working on tonight's slides, getting it ready for us to understand, taking input from all of us to make sure that this budget truly reflects the way that the council sees our city going forward. It's not to say that it's a perfect budget. I think we can all agree that measure five and 50 and how we do property taxes has made it incredibly challenging for cities to operate. I spend the majority of my time in the legislature searching out money for projects um, because we simply can't afford to do all the things that we want to do. Uh, the eight large city mayors have been working in tandem together to help the legislature understand the financial strains that cities are under. Where their cities are the level of government of last resort we are dealing with humanitarian crisis on a daily basis, and our budget truly reflects the last three years of crisis management. 
My hope is as we look towards the future and stability becomes more clear, our budget's going to return to a place um, that not just delivers services, but delivers joy. I know this budget is gonna be hard for us, just like upcoming ones, but we see a future where our city is not just functioning, but fl flourishing, safe, sustainable, connected, accessible, and livable for all those that live and work here. Uh, so tonight, I encourage you guys to write down questions, send them in, get the ones that you have answered, answered. So when we meet again to vote on the budget, we can have a really great conversation moving the budget forward. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. You're on mute, Chair. Sorry, thank, thank you. The next budget item uh, or the next uh, agenda item is the budget message uh, from our city manager and then our finance director. So Jenny. All right, well, thank you. I do have some slides to share. All right, well, good evening, Budget Committee. Thank you so much for your time. I am pleased to present the uh, fiscal year 24-25 operating and capital budget this evening. Um, as you know, and as the mayor shared, uh, we embarked on an unprecedented journey uh, when one that we had to rely on our grit and our resilience as a community to navigate some really treacherous terrain. Um, but despite that path, the Beaverton closed a $10 million budget. Um, gap last year, making sacrifices to preserve vital services for our residents and our businesses. And I want to thank the budget committee, the council and the community, but more importantly, the city of Beaverton organization, uh, who without skipping a beat, continue to serve every day, every hour, every minute, every second, this community as we rebuilt our fiscal house. So this proposed budget um, is a year of reimagination. It's an opportunity to pause and to take stock and to invest in a stronger fiscal foundation and framework, and one that certainly is built to last. So this evening, we'll cover five key topics, starting with our service accomplishments over the past year. Uh, we'll discuss the budget framework and how it guides budget development processes, um, our proposed budget and how it moves Beaverton forward, and the strategies that we implemented to balance the budget, and then finally wrapping up with next steps and budget items and actions that are on the horizon. So Beaverton's natural resilience contributes to its forward uh, thinking approach, always planning for what's needed in the now and the future. And a great example in front of you in this graphic is our planning for our now uh, 12,000 square foot new shelter, which is currently under construction. It's a prime example of how we proactively leverage resources and relationships to secure a shelter for our most vulnerable. Um, approximately 3 million uh, was secured through state funding to acquire and improve the new shelter facility, uh, preserving taxpayer dollars so that those could be focused on core services like the library, uh, safety, landscaping, and building maintenance. And we're also planning for the future with an anticipated development of 5,000 units at Cooper Mountain. Uh, we also built a $5.5 million, uh, excuse me, million water um, reservoir and 1,400 linear feet of 24 inch diameter drinking water transition main along Kemmer Road. That's a lot. Um, but our for forward thinking orientation can also be seen in the council's legislative framework which directed our lobbying efforts resulting in $3 million in state grant funding for the Kemmer Booster Pump Station. This is another incredibly important uh, project uh, that is central to serving future residents in the upper elevations of Cooper Mountain. So Beaverton's values are grounded in service, which is why this year's ice storm didn't stop our employees from working 24 seven uh, seven days a week, 24 hours, seven days a week, and their efforts ensured a coordinated emergency response to make sure that our community addressed all of their road and safety needs. And they answered the call or calls liter literally and figuratively. Um, but I couldn't be more proud also of the ground that's been covered by the council since the form of government change. For nearly three years, council's been steadfast in its goal setting, helping to the organization's center um, on outcomes. Uh, and the council recently created a governance subcommittee, which has been working hard over the past uh, six months to update council rules under the new form of government. And we've made significant process and I'm hoping to present a draft to you by the end of summer. 
We also continue to be a regional leader using Metro bond proceeds to build affordable housing with plans underway to build an affordable housing, a senior housing in downtown Beaverton. But we recognize that in order to continue this good work, we've got to invest in our people. And I have to say that there isn't a week that goes by when I don't receive an email, a note, or a call about one or more Beaverton employees and how they go above and beyond the call of duty for our residents and businesses. We continue to make strides in purple pipe uh, infrastructure and sustainability related projects and anticipate receiving funding in the millions for South Cooper Mountain next fiscal year. And staying with the theme of infrastructure, our work on transportation initiatives around mobility and accessibility continue to garner attention and support. And so we can see these successes in the numbers. We continue to be a leader when it comes to spending other people's money. Uh, we received $4 million in federal funding, thanks to Congresswoman Bamanichi, um, for a community demonstration project as part of the downtown loop. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the loop project, um, it's an opportunity to improve pedestrian safety and accessibility in the downtown, and really to help people reach their, def their destination and maybe their favorite restaurant or shops too. Um, the library is also one of the busiest uh, libraries in the state of Oregon, and it distributed approximately 5,600 uh, free books as a part of its Ready to Read grant um, from the state library. And it also receives funding to support this endeavor from the WCCLS, which is our countywide library system, and the Friends of the Library Foundation. And this is critical because it helps families build their own home library. We've also been successful in removing impaired drivers from city streets. And while this number is unfortunate and high, the number of DUIs um, driving under the influence and in alcoholism, this tends to be a national epidemic and something that we're working hard to correct. But a positive thing that I wanna point out to you is that our Beaverton residents have an opportunity to participate in our behavioral health court um, in lieu of fines and jail time. And currently our recidivism rate is very low. It's actually 3%, which means that those that go through our program are less likely to reoffend, and it's ensuring their safety and the safety of others. Um, in 2023, we also received another million dollars in federal and state grant funding for a nonprofit incubator program, and that's designed to support culturally specific startup nonprofits here in Beaverton. And we're almost finished and uh, with the construction, we should see that done in the next fiscal year. Another legislative success is the receipt of child care grants for grant startup and expansion. This is for new in-home and center-based child care. Both Beaverton and cities in Washington County actually are considered a child care desert, meaning that one out of every three children under the age of five have limited access to a child care facility. And grants like these can be a complete game changer for families with young children. And last, we've added approximately 400 housing units to the existing pipeline with more coming next year. Our actions continue to be grounded in service and our numbers prove it. So let's talk a little bit about the budget framework. Um, so the budget development process is rooted in council goals and priorities. And priorities are established and reaffirmed annually by the council. And these inform how resources should be allocated for the upcoming budget year. So last fall, the council reprioritized its priorities um, to four core areas. And those are diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, uh, community and organizational well-being financial recovery, and natural resources. And the budget framework's also informed by guiding principles, and these were established by the council as well. And the five guiding principles were designed to help inform decision-making in a constrained resource environment. And the principles primarily focus on maintaining basic and vital services, advancing council priorities, ensuring equity where possible when we're having to make reductions, uh, minimizing impacts on the community and the organization, and implementing reductions that are sustainable over the long term. So fiscal year 23-24 uh, was a year of leaning into the hard, and something I think Beaverton does incredibly well, because nothing great comes easy. But this work did not happen overnight. It actually started in fiscal year 21-22, where the council prudently set aside a limited amount of ARPA funding to stabilize the city's reserves, and then allocated resources to begin the fiscal sustainability planning process. 
uh, in October of 2022, the council formed a council fiscal sustainability subcommittee to help guide the development of budget strategies, which are guided by the council's annual priorities. And this year, as a part of the city's fiscal sustainability action plan, the city implemented several strategies. Um, some of them include citywide efficiency assessments and a number of uh, fee studies, including a user fee study, a cost of service study, and a cost allocation study, and that focuses on overhead. And all of them help to inform our cost recovery levels, expenses, and future fees. And these are gonna be discussed actually um, in early summer. Water, storm, and sewer rate studies are also underway, in addition to a transportation utility um, study, fee study, and that's scheduled for discussion this fall. So now we're gonna move on to uh, the fiscal year 24-25 proposed budget. So the city budget's approximately $500 million, and it's comprised of three different parts. Uh, the general fund, which is 22% or 110 million, uh, the capital budget, which is 25% or 124 million. And um, the capital budget, as a side note, also includes the Beaverton Urban uh, Renewal Area Fund or Bura. Uh, and then the other funds is about 53% of the budget. And we'll talk a little bit about those in a second. And that equates to $246 million. And a financial summary of the citywide budget can be found under the city manager's message tab, starting on page VIII. So as you can see, the city has several funds and a quick list of funds can be found under the citywide tab on pages 23 through 28. However, the main focus of tonight is going to be the general fund, which is discretionary funding, meaning that it can be spent on nearly any type of activity or service. And the general fund, as you know, supports core services like police, economic development, ports, planning, and code enforcement, just to name a few. Um, and other funds like the library, building, street, utility, urban renewal, they're all non-discretionary, which means that their revenue is restricted and can only be used for specific expenses not general fund expenses. So our focus tonight, as I said, is gonna be on the general fund. And later in the presentation, we're gonna also discuss the library fund. All the other funds uh, will be covered during the May 14th presentation. So starting with general fund expenses, um, the total general fund is $110 million. And this chart shows different general fund expense categories. And you can find this chart under the general fund tab on page 31. And because of the nature of our business, it takes people to provide services. So it's no wonder that a good majority or more than a majority of our expenses are related to personnel at 61%. And so when I say personnel, that includes salaries, healthcare, and retirement. The remaining three categories, um, contingencies, transfers, capital outlay, um, and materials and supplies, um, those are much smaller. And the smallest one is the capital outlay, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, contingencies are about 13%, and those are our reserve funds. Transfers um, are 12%, and those are transfers out to other funds. So think about utilities, streets, and bureau for services that the general fund might be providing or needs to be reimbursed for. Um, these transfers are for debt service, facility costs, city buildings for city buildings, and internal service costs like fleet and computers. Materials and supplies runs at about 11%, and that's for things like equipment, uh, professional services, office supplies, and training. And then the capital outlay, which is the small one, um, is used to maintain and upgrade and acquire and repair capital assets. So this bar chart is actually another way to look at general fund expenses, but by department. And so you can find this under the general fund summary tab on page 30. And as you can see, the most expensive uh, department, the blue bar, is the police department. And that makes up about 40% of general fund expenses. And police tend to be expensive for a variety of reasons, but mainly because when you hire a police officer, um, there's additional costs beyond say, uh, salary and benefits. Um, you need to have tools, supplies, training, equipment, vehicles, uniforms, and other required expenses. And that usually increases the price tag. 
the orange bar is non-departmental, and that's about 23% of expenses. And this is a collection of expenses that don't necessarily fit one particular department. Hence, we call it non-departmental. Um, and some examples uh, for you include citywide type of membership fees, like the League of Oregon Cities, and then transfers for things like building maintenance for City Hall or for the court at the Griffith Building. Um, there's insurance um, expenses for property and liability, debt service for a variety of projects, one including the Public Safety Center, and then the Beaverton Central Plant. Uh, and then the third highest is uh, the community development, which is the gray bar, and that's at 12%. And community development provides a lot of different services, including planning, uh, site development review, uh, which is the review, excuse me, of engineering design for construction for new development, building, economic development, code enforcement, and transportation planning. So the largest source of revenue um, for the city and the general fund is property taxes. And that's at about 46%. And that's the blue portion of the circle right in front of you. The second largest is what we call um, working capital, beginning working capital. And that is basically what you have left over from the prior year. And think of it kind of as your general fund savings account. Uh, the other categories are smaller revenue sources, and we have you know, some limited control over those, and they include fines. Some of those are set, set by the state. Uh, we have permits, charges for services, so think user fees. Uh, intergovernmental revenue, those are grants, so those go up and down every year. Uh, and then right-of-way fees, and if you're not familiar with right-of-way fees, those are fees imposed on utilities that use the city's right-of-way. So that includes sidewalks, uh, street surfaces, and the spaces that are above and below them. And you can find a detailed explanation of property tax and a list of general fund revenue sources under the general fund summary tab, pages 30 through 45. So this is a stacked chart, which is not in your budget binder, but it reflects all of the city general fund revenue sources over the past eight years. And I want to orient you to two of them. Um, first of all, uh, focus on the blue and the green bars. So the blue bar is the beginning working capital. And as I mentioned, it's what you have left over from your prior uh, year. Year over year, it's actually been fairly stable, but with a small dip in 22-23. And that's when we use some of our contingency to balance the budget. Now the green bar is property tax, and you'll notice um, starting from fiscal year 1718 to 2223, uh, the city's proposed revenue tax um, is has relatively no growth. Right, it's remained close to the same, and it it wasn't until the city began to levy its full rate of four dollars and sixty two cents per thousand assessed valuation in 2324 that we saw it kind of do a little bit of an uptick, um, but actually not by much in the big picture. And also keep in mind that the um, numbers that you see for 2324 and 2425 are estimates, so those can change. But despite the recent adjustment, um, Beaverton's resources to support basic services has been constrained and hasn't caught up with inflation or the pace of expenses. So another way to look at our constrained resources is through the property tax dollar. And this graphic really does a good job of helping illustrate that point. Taxpayer property um, tax dollar is shared actually with multiple agencies and special districts. And so Beaverton only collects 22 cents for every property tax dollar spent for key services like uh, police, courts, library, and planning. Um, and as you can see, uh, a number of folks share in that dollar. Bura, for instance, which is the Beaverton Urban Renewal Agency, receives three cents based on tax increment. And that is the growth that's generated above the property tax base. And Bura actually only applies to a specific geographic location. So think central Beaverton and parts of downtown. And those funds are reinvested into the area so it can spur economic development and make key improvements, which increase the assessed value of the area. And then the remainder of the property tax is shared between the county, the school district, um, fire, THPRD, which park is park and recreation, and metro. And for those of you that are adding up the cents, I know that this adds to 100 or 101, and so that's due to rounding. All right, this is the general fund uh, financial forecast, and it models future uh, budget shortfalls if no structural corrections are made. And you can find this chart under the city manager summary tab on page XIX. Uh, the orange trend line reflects expenses, and the dark green line is revenue. 
And you can see a growing gap between the two lines uh, because expenses clearly are outpacing uh, resources. And the proposed budget for 24-25 will close the gap in the chart, but future adjustments on both the revenue and the expenditure side will need to be made uh, to reduce the projected deficit in the years ahead. Uh, the purple line is our target reserve and fund balance, and that should be about 11% of expenses. That's our goal right now. The black line is our projected ending fund balance, or what we'll call reserves. And you can see that we've actually managed to keep it slightly above our target, and that's really due to, at one point, infusing ARPA dollars and also strategic savings, but it's projected to drop below target fund balance levels unless we implement permanent structural changes. So key drivers of our um, past and current budget shortfalls are really due to four primary reasons. The first is revenue, um, the slow growth of the city's revenue base, uh, past revenue loss due to changes in consumer behavior. So we've had a reduction in franchise fees, which is applied to cable and utilities. Uh, we've seen reductions in the marijuana tax um, and loss of right-of-way fees due to legal rulings. Uh, the two other drivers of change are the economy and a cost of living impact. So inflation was at an all-time high at 8.1% in 2022, and that didn't start falling off until about mid-2023. Uh, and the city felt significant impacts on salary and benefits due to wage adjustments and increases in benefits and, of course, major cost shifts in materials and supplies and equipment. And those impacts, by the way, were in the tune of millions of dollars affecting city services. Um, so it was raising costs to secure vendors and to complete major capital and projects. So next is walking through the budget balancing and how we made that happen. Uh, so the, the fiscal year 24-25 proposed budget closes a gap of $1.7 million. And this is largely due to expenses outpacing revenue. And you can see that in uh, the rectangle there that says budget starting point. Uh, the revenue strategies included prior year savings and use of fund balance, again, um, our reserves, which actually mitigated the need for any workforce reductions this year. And we're really thankful for that. Uh, we also applied revenue transfers to the general fund from other funds to account for city overhead. And then also um, we had interest income uh, on the general fund. And so that was a part of the revenue as well. So combined, this totals $6.6 .6 million. And approximately 1.1 million in expenditure reductions were made. Um, and those came from materials and supplies, uh, temporary help and the elimination of unfilled vacancies. So here's an outline of the balancing strategies, but in narrative form with slightly more detail. And the major revenue strategies, of course, includes using some of our fund balance and prior year savings, but we also had some underspending that was occurring in materials and supplies and citywide vacancies. And that added to our budget savings of the 6.6. .6. Um, I wanna, as a side note, let you know the average cost of a general fund employee runs about $185,000. So that's including salaries and benefits combined. So six vacancies, for instance, can easily add up to a million dollars just to give you a sense of order of magnitude. Um, our expense reductions totaled 1.1, as I said earlier, and fell into two buckets, materials and supplies and personnel. So materials and supplies, they included uh, decreases like professional services, um, external legal services in particular, travel and training, although we did really make an intentional uh, choice to try to limit that as much as possible um, in citywide programmatic areas. And then select vacant positions from the general fund and the library fund were eliminated in addition to some temporary help. But as we strengthen our fiscal house by shedding costs where we can, we also recognize that we need to reinforce our foundation and framing through intentional investments. So to do this, the budget invests in people and priorities, initiatives, and capital and equipment while making strategic reductions. So I wanted to share some of the ways that we're investing in order to advance the council and community priorities through the general fund and other funds. 
So uh, let's talk a little bit about people and priorities. So the proposed budget restores the cultural inclusion manager. We were able to offset um, applicable library costs with opioid settlement proceeds, which allows us to fund this position that was eliminated last year. If you recall, this position was eliminated so that we could secure and maintain five days a week at the Murray Shoal branch. So we are able to find alternative revenue sources uh, to be able to um, support the library and keep the library open five days a week, but yet um, allow me to use general fund dollars to support the inclusion um, cultural, excuse me, cultural inclusion manager. Uh, we also invested in a sustainability project specialist, which will be key to supporting grants and strengthening our climate um, action efforts and moving the Beaverton Climate Action Plan forward. Uh, we adjusted our staffing and building to keep up with the development activity uh, and demand. And we also increased the building uh, library monitor to full time so they can address facility issues and safety. Oops, a little bit too soon. Um, and front and center are key initiatives that are going to continue to make Beaverton what it is. It's a great destination. Uh, and so our fiscal work is really gonna focus on continued fiscal uh, sustainability work around efficiencies and fees and alignment of advisory board work with council goals. Uh, we're updating our economic development strategic plan. We're planning next steps as it relates to the first street dining commons. Uh, developing a police uh, community engagement plan and investing in wellness and mental health resources for police officers and preparing for the expansion of photo radar and speed cameras, which will come back to you actually within the next six months with a resource request. And then finally, um, we also need to recognize we are a growing city and we've got to continue to invest in our capital needs. So on the horizon are lighting um, improvements for the library, the purchase of sewer cameras, uh, we'll also, as I mentioned, do the construction of the booster pump station at the, for the future development of Cooper Mountain, thanks to state funding, uh, the construction of Laurelwood Avenue sidewalks, and the planning and designing for the loop, and then finally, the construction of a multipath connection from Fano Creek to uh, Allen Boulevard. All right, now we can move on to next steps. So we released the budget on May 1st, and we're here today to talk about the general fund in the library. And then moving on to May 14th, the budget committee will consider utility funds, a capital fund and shared revenue and provide any amendments to the budget and make some decisions. And then we'll move over to June 4th where this will come before the council for their final consideration and adoption. And once the budget is adopted and needs to be adopted no later than the end of June, uh, it will go in full effect July 1 and that is when the new fiscal year begins. So I wanted to close by um, reminding you that a community, as you know, is always a work of progress and success is always under construction. And while the road that we traveled this past year wasn't easy, the path forward is clear. And the proposed budget would not have been possible without the grit and resilience of this organization and community and the sacrifices made to ensure that Beaverton remained on solid ground. So thank you for leaning into the heart and the heart is what makes it great. And it's what makes Beaverton great. So with that, I'd like to turn um, the next set of conversations over to Debbie Lautner. She and Susan Cole, they are from our finance department. They'll cover the general fund overview. I'll come in and talk a little bit about general fund departments, and then we'll talk about the general fund forecast. So I will stop sharing my screen. And okay. I'm finished, you. thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny, for that ex excellent explanation. Um, so, uh, Debbie, do you have anything on the proposed, the general proposed budget? I know you're going to I, talk about the general fund, but I have a whole. Yes, I, I talk about the whole, the larger budget, and the um, and the general fund. Okay. Um, well, you're up on the larger budget now. Before we ask questions. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'm going to minimize you guys so I can see my screen. Feel free to interrupt me if there's something you need to ask a question on. So we're going to talk about the um, the basic overview of our budget. And let's see if I can get this to go forward. There we go. Um, so our budget is developed with um, 21 guiding principles, which are um, in the binder following the budget message and the, um, the add-on to the budget message. Uh, those guiding principles uh, discuss transparency in budget development, DEI, um, 
again, climate stability, forecasting, supplemental um, budgets, reserves, fiscal planning, maintenance, maintaining our core services, um, not using a, accounting gimmicks to balance your budget, um, uh, getting cost recovery, um, hence the fee study, using one-time money for one-time things, those, those types of um, 21 guiding principles. So um, you can look in, in the document and find the full text of that. Um, our total budget, as um, our city manager said, is about a half a billion dollars. Um, overall, here's our revenues by type, um, our beginning working capital. So that is the beginning working capital in every fund. Um, and they all have different, well, basically the same reserve requirements, but so, slightly different depending on the um, type of fund. Uh, and you can then see uh, how our revenues are broken up, taxes being our largest source of revenue, intergovernmental revenues, sharing um, money amongst agencies is the second largest followed by um, bond proceeds. Um, and then there's interfund transfers. Um, so expenditures, again, about a half a billion dollars. Uh, our largest expenditures really are in personnel and um, materials and services that support what the personnel does um, for the organization. And then we have contingencies, which is, um, as was mentioned before, contingencies really are the, the reserve funds. Um, we like to also show it by department, um, just so that you can understand this is for, uh, every department and the funds that they manage. Um, so in you'll see public works being a very large department. That's because the utility funds that public works manage is, is a large portion of our budget. Um, so uh, we have public works operations about 24%, infrastructure about 19%, um, community development about 11%, and police about 9%. So those really follow along with what Jenny was telling us as far as our largest departments. So we always show you some numbers um, to go with the charts. So this is a comparison showing last year's budget compared to this year's proposed budget. Um, we do pull, this is just the revenues, the um, non-revenue receipts are, are pulled down. So those would be things like debt, um, you know, where we, if we borrow money, it's not really revenue. Um, so um, that's just pulled below the line so you can see in total the resources that we have, um, our revenues versus the other resources. As far as expenditures, we again, expenditures by type. Um, you can, as a comparison to last year, you can see that our personnel costs have gone up about 6.8%. Our materials and services have remained flat. Our debt service did go up because we did issue a bond in um, just a couple months ago. We closed on a bond for our uh, water program. So um, that did go up. And then our interfund transfers have gone down. So um, overall, when we look at property tax, our property tax, the assessed value of the city is very high. <laughs> so, and um, so it's $12 billion. Uh, our assessed value was as, as in this budget is assumed to grow at 3.73%. The um, Bureau increment, uh, increment um, that projected growth is at 10%. So as you build things, your, um, your property tax grows at a greater rate than if it's just something that's sitting there that's um, year to year. So as we, as we build things in Bureau, our property tax, grows in that area greater at a greater rate than the rest of the city. The, the rest of the city has an average uh, projected growth of just under 4%. Uh, we are charging the um, full tax rate of 4.618, um, zero, $4.61.8 <laughs> per thousand uh, dollars of assessed value. And our tax rate for debt has actually gone down this year because our, our debt obligation is less. When you look at personnel, um, so this is in a, um, just shows personnel across the across the board and overall how um, we're we're reducing our personnel over 
across everything. So uh, we do, we did transfer some, you know, personnel amongst um, departments uh, in the current fiscal year. Our personnel services are increasing by 6.83%, and that is uh, related primarily to the increase in healthcare. Um, MODA has increased 19.8% going into fiscal year 25, and Kaiser increased 10%. Um, we don't have cost of living adjustments uh, settled with SEIU or management, but we do with um, the police association. Police association will get a one and a half percent COLA on July 1st and another 2% on January 1st. We did not make a significant change to the number of personnel um, within the city, as you can see. And our departments continue to work on reorganizing efforts to make sure that we're creating good team dynamics and being efficient. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the general fund. This may be a repeat of some of what Jenny talked about, but that's okay. Um, so overall, we talk about the general fund resources. Our uh, revenues are 100, our resources are $110 million. Um, which includes uh, our beginning working capital is 19% of that. Um, property taxes are 46%. As um, It is the largest source of revenue for the general fund, uh, followed by some other taxes. We have, you know, other taxes that, that break up, bring up a significant amount. And then um, intergovernmental revenues and interfund transfers um, also are uh, significant resources for the general fund. So as always, we show a chart followed by a um, the numbers uh, because people like to look at information differently. So we we show the total revenues um, actually going down a little bit uh, year over year when you look at just revenues, and and that's specifically on the interfund transfers. Um, we've uh, decreased that. It looks like I'm missing a a decrease there, but it's a, a decrease of twenty two point. 4% um, or $2.7 million. Um, our beginning fund balance has gone up, which is a good thing because as we try to rebuild those reserves and make sure that we are healthy and resilient going forward. So expenditures by type, as was mentioned before, personnel services is 61% of our overall general fund expenditure as it should be. Our general fund is the um, fund where our the most of our employees reside that provide services to the community and as a service organization um, it's the people that provide those services so that's appropriate um, our materials and services at 12 percent and transfers at 13 percent when you look at expenditures and again this is expenditures by section not everything listed here is actually a department so i i changed it to section just so that it Try to make it a little clear, more clear. Um, so our, our police is, as was mentioned before, just uh, it's thirty nine percent of our budget, which is appropriate because they only reside in the general fund, and we do um, within some of the other uh, programs. We may have some staff that resides in other funds as well. Um, so while you saw public works was our largest. Um, kind of owner of the budget on the total budget, you can see here, public works operations is only 3% of the general fund. Again, we we'll always give you the numbers to back up um, the, the chart. Um, as for general fund positions, there was a lot of movement um, to get to a total of 3.31 added positions. So in um, the city administration, we did add one uh, FTE, that stands for full-time equivalent, um, a government relations manager, which will be offset with savings um, to our professional services. We did add 0.33 FTE to the ACM to make that position full-time again. Um, initially, the um, Current budget that was that position was only going to work through the end of December, um, but then we uh, made an adjustment as a supplemental to keep that position on um, part time through the end of the fiscal year, and our city manager has uh, determined that that is a necessary position to ma maintain management of the organization. So 
we added back a third of that position to make it full time. The two FTE emergency management um, employees that were in city administration moved to the police department. So you, you see a, a reduction of two in um, community engagement and communications, and you see an addition of two in the police department. So they kind of offset each other. Um, we did a reduce, uh, you can see a 0.17 FTE reduction uh, last fiscal year or the current fiscal year that we're in, the reductions we made, we made uh, at the in September. And so there was a small portion of the fiscal year 24 budget that included those people, 0.17. So for the positions, there was one position in city administration that was laid off. That 0.17 FTE was removed as cleanup to make sure that position is now no longer um, part of the organization. We funded one FTE program coordinator. Um, that was an unfunded position that we refunded this year. And that was the um, position that was unfunded last this current fiscal year in order to um, provide additional funding to the library. Uh, we were able to refund that position this year uh, using opioid settlement funds to backfill and, and maintain the library. We reduced a 0.25 FTE support specialist, but added a 0.75 program coordinator just to be more efficient and, and better align with the, the needs. In community development, we eliminated three vacant positions that the department said they had been vacant for a while and they could live without. So there was a senior planner, a program coordinator, and a permit technician. In municipal court, we eliminated a limited term position that had been funded from the ARPA government assistance. So that's the American Res Rescue Plan Act, which came from the federal government um, in relation to the pandemic. We had a limited term position and that, po that position, that term has ended. So the position has gone. In the police department, you see additions there, and that's from the expansion of the bike team and the addition of the emergency management. Um, program. It also includes a small amount of overlap for a long-term employee that is uh, leaving to allow for some training. And in sustainability, we added one um, program or project specialist, and that should be offset with grants. As you've seen this before, here's our general fund financial forecast, um, just showing that we still have some work to do. And then I will turn it back over to Jenny to go through the um, the departments. And I'll just tell me when to go forward, Jenny. Great, thank you. Um, so I'll be going through the departments, very, very high level uh, for the budget committee. And if you have detailed questions later, we'll go ahead and let the department's um, heads answer those for you. So starting with city council, uh, the city council budget can be uh, found on page 46 of your budget binder. And the council uh, budget includes programs for both the mayor and the council, and it continues to maintain prior uh, service levels and funding levels with no significant changes. Uh, next slide. So city administration includes the city manager's office uh, that can be found on page 54 and the city attorney, and that's on page 157. And the city manager's um, budget is closely aligned with the advancement of course council priorities and implements a performance management initiative with staffing resources and citywide efficiency assessments that are all aligned with the council's sustainability goals. Uh, the budget also restructures government relations this year. It brings in state and federal lobbyist management and oversight in-house, and we're currently recruiting for the position right now, which is a government relations manager position. Funding is included to support a state lobbyist contract as well. Uh, additionally, as Debbie noted, the assistant city manager position will be restored to full-time to provide better oversight of city departments and divisions. And then wrapping up, the city attorney's office also maintains service levels. We made some moderate, moderate reductions uh, to ex um, external legal services. Next slide. So Office of Equity and Inclusion, that could be found on page 80. 
Uh, we're slowly building the equity office and propose to restore the program manager position and provide temporary employee funds uh, so we can really be intentional about implementing diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging initiatives. And these are also initiatives that are a part of the council's priorities. Um, by redirecting a limited amount of the opioid settlement, as I mentioned, we're able to restore this position um, to support the library and use general fund uh, to support the mag program manager position. Uh, the budget also reallocates the um, events program to the equity office, and that's really to facilitate more culturally specific events and activities. And then as a side note, the multicultural assessment that's actually gonna be completed uh, this upcoming fiscal year. Uh, next slide. So finance department, this is located on page 115. And there are no significant changes to the finance department budget. Um, strategic focus is going to continue to be on the council's priority of fiscal recovery. Uh, finance actually is juggling a lot of balls right now with five fee studies to better understand a cost of services and overhead and our uh, fee recovery levels. Um, and also where there's an opportunity to update existing fees. And there will be a council work session um, on the user fees that'll be scheduled uh, in early July, followed by a transportation uh, utility fee um, session that's a fall, excuse me, work session uh, in early fall. Next slide. So human resources, again, this maintains service levels with no significant changes, um, but the next year is going to continue to focus on process improvement and innovation academy. We've actually already sent our first cohort um, of 14, and it's an intensive four-day workshop in April. And we'll, we're doing a second group um, at the end of May, May 21st uh, through the 24th. And then we're actually gonna be scheduling more um, teams to go through the new, in the new fiscal year. And the other thing that's been really successful um, as a part of some of the morale issues that we wanna address in the organization is our new employee uh, orientation, which is called Embark. It's great. It actually pairs up um, the new employee with kind of a, a veteran employee and they get to know each other and have a person to call on when they have questions. And we're also going to be um, launching our supervisory training opportunity with Empower. And that's a monthly uh, training session focusing on relevant and timely topics uh, for supervisors. Um, and some important metrics that I wanted to leave you uh, was that our employee workforce has steadily increased um, in those identifying that are not Caucasian from 17.8% to 21.7% in 2024. And hiring for veterans increased actually from 0% in April of 2023 to 9.1% in April of 2024. And promotions with veteran status also increased from 8.8 .8 in April of 23 to 9.8 .8 in April of 24. Next slide. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides. This is the information technology and services slide because it, rep it represents the implementation of the city's new um, IT department. And that can be found on page 468. Um, since the implementation of the new department, we've made great strides in advancing uh, citywide internal support and customer service responsiveness. Um, we're wrapping up a citywide IT assessment, and that's evaluating our software, our hardware, internal processes, uh, security, staffing, and um, everything under the sun. And so the findings from the assessment are going to help inform future decisions around technology needs. Uh, the proposed budget um, also expands tools and training for staff. Um, expands uh, portable devices um, for deployment and then consolidates our software platform so that we can actually reduce our licensing costs. So we've actually had some savings. Uh, we're also heavily investing in cybersecurity as well as ongoing AV services for the council chambers. Next slide. So this is general services and this can be found on page 89 and it covers our sustainability and recycling and efforts. So the most important change to note to this budget is the addition of a project specialist position. And that is so important because it's going to increase staff capacity to support our grants and our sustainability efforts. This is also going to help facilitate the work that we have planned for the Beaverton Climate Action Plan or BCAP 2.0. Um, it's the update and a replacement of the 2019 uh, plan. And part of this effort also involves completing the technical preparation for a greenhouse gas emissions inventory, the first um, that we've had since 2017. 
uh, will be receiving $152,000 uh, energy efficiency and conservation block grant, in addition to an EPA climate pollution, pollution per, um, reduction grant, that's a mouthful, uh, to participate in regional planning. And on the recycling side, uh, we'll implement a phased um, reduction uh, rate program, so that will discount the cost of garbage and recycling services to income qualified community members. And then we're also going to be starting up the business food scrap program and expand residential composting to higher density housing. All right, the next slide. So this is community engagement and communications, otherwise known as CEC. Uh, our, this budget can be found on page 63. Uh, CEC provides uh, citywide engagement and communications and supports city projects and activities and events, and it's um, highly aligned with the council's uh, goals and priorities to make sure that we're um, elevating those and pushing them out to the community for awareness. Uh, the division also, if you're not aware, leads our homeless services in partnership with the county, oversees social service funding, uh, and manages city board and commissions and neighborhood programs, including our neighborhood association committees, uh, otherwise known as the NACs. So work is underway and planned for the expedite, um, expediting the transition of our year round shelter. So that's currently under construction, implementing our board and commission work plan initiative. And this uh, goal is to align the activities of our boards with our council priorities, uh, implementing an online tool to promote um, and increase civic engagement. And the reductions in this budget are relatively modest and have been aligned to actually reflect actual spending. And there have been no changes in social service funding, um, which I'm very happy about, and that is approximately $311,000. Next slide. So municipal court, that could be found on page 145. And the court budget is really positioned to explore some grant uh, opportunities to enhance the treatment courts and is also up for considerations is really great news um, for it to be nationally recognized mentor uh, because of the uniqueness of our program so more and stay tuned uh, for that. Uh, the budget has been adjusted to reflect um, an increase actually in court appointed uh, attorney costs, and this is in consideration of national trends. We're seeing this um, across the United States, so that is probably one of the main um, adjustments that we've made to the budget. And in light of this, because we recognize the cost associated with it, we're exploring public defense models to reduce expenses. So we may be coming back to you with some alternatives to help lower those costs. The court's also preparing for the expansion of the speed uh, red light camera program. And we're currently actually assessing all of the upfront costs that we'll need and future costs. And we'll put together a supplemental budget request that'll be made uh, probably within the next six months. All right, next slide. So this is police and the police department budget can be found on page 165. And the police department budget reflects resources to implement a comprehensive engagement strategy. This came out of a, some third party recommendations that the council received at a work session. And this is really to establish um, stronger relationships with um, underrepresented communities. We've included funds uh, to improve wellness um, and mental health access for our officers. We've adjusted the training budget to pre-COVID level levels to implement recommended training priorities. Again, this is out of the third party recommendations around succession planning, engagement, and then just overall operational efficiencies. Uh, more importantly, we've expanded the bike team, as you know, from four officers to six, enhancing the safety in the downtown core, um, and the emergency management program will complete its structural needs assessment shortly, and that will include a recommendation for additional resources to support the current uh, manager and cert. So again, a likely a supplemental request will be coming your way um, in the fall to talk more about what the needs are there. Next slide. So this is community development, and that budget can be found on page 190. And this budget completes the construction of the incubator that I mentioned earlier uh, to support uh, startups of businesses and culturally specific nonprofit organizations. It's located here in City Hall. Uh, it implements the Bureau five-year action plan to spur redevelopment, affordable housing, and wayfinding. Uh, it provides resources for the design of the First Street Dining Common Commons and continues to facilitate Cooper Mountain Community Plan and Tree Code work in anticipation of future development. Um, some of the changes that you should be aware of, um, there's modest reductions to the Oregon Startup Center in Beaverton Downtown Association. Uh, it does eliminate three vacant positions, but adds two positions in the building division, 
uh, to meet development demands and succession planning needs. And finally, um, the work continues on our uh, transportation system plan and of course the loop design. Next slide. So this is public works and this will cover all funds, um, including the general fund. And this departmental budget can be found on page 215. So the public works budget focuses on several water projects this year, including the transfer of water meter reading um, from uh, TVWD, uh, the water district, uh, to the city of Beaverton. Uh, we're also going to be implementing a meter infrastructure um, for remote water meters. And then, of course, the construction of the first phase of the north transmission line uh, inner tie. Uh, resources are also allocated for the re-roofing of City Hall and the Public uh, Works Operations Facility. Those will be big endeavors. And key changes uh, actually include a departmental reorganization, and this really better aligns uh, funding sources with services, and it's going to create a lot of efficiencies for the department. The department also is creating um, a business division within the department, and one of the reasons why is that really is to support the continued process improvement that they have underway. And last slide. And this is the library fund and the library fund can be found on page uh, 314. And the library fund maintains service levels at all library locations and expands the building monitor to full time. Uh, changes include the elimination, as we mentioned, of two vacant positions and continues to assess and realign uh, duties to ensure smooth operations. Um, I've uh, spoken um, with the library director and have talked um, specifically about how we navigate with this, given some of the questions that have come up, and we're able to absorb these eliminations um, because we have issues around the decline in circulation of physical materials and people are starting to rely more on digital materials. And then also we're working to realign our volunteer program and all of those um, according to staff are something that is easily um, accomplished. And so the library fund is going to actually be talked about in more detail by finance staff. So I'll pause in my comments here and turn it back over to Debbie. Thank you. All right. So the library fund. Well, before we get to the library fund, um, which is our last agenda item, I wondered if there are any questions about the general fund from the committee. I don't have a question, just really quick. Is this PowerPoint available somewhere? It will be. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we'll we'll post it online tomorrow on that um, budget committee page where we were putting the questions and answers. We'll, we'll put the presentations up there as well. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? I have a question overall on a couple of the budgets. I'm seeing that the investment interest earnings is moving quite a bit upward. And I was just curious, since I haven't heard like a change in interest rates from 2024, was the 2024 budget lower on, on expected or how are we necessarily going all the way up? Like, because I guess for the on page 43, for example, we have investment interest earnings and we're expecting $305,000, and then our budget is $866,000. And that just seems, and I've seen on a couple pages, so I was just curious of strategy or what was causing that. So I can briefly talk about that, and Susan, feel free to jump in if you have more information. But um, we actually have been working on more um, actively managing our portfolio and splitting it so that we have a core versus a, a, a little bit longer term, which allows us to increase the investment earnings um, over the long term. Um, so it's, it's a change in strategy that has provided that and then allows us to, based on actual history from the change of strategy, has allowed us to increase that. I will just add that our portfolio has been earning higher interest rates. Um, so keep in mind, we look at budget to budget. And so the information is up to you know 12 to 18 months apart in these numbers that we're looking at. And the interest has increased. Uh, the, the local government investment pool for right now, for example, is earning 5%, mm -hmm. whereas last year, I think it was maybe three and a half or four. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah, I put my name in the chat. I don't know if we're doing oh, okay. it. I yeah, okay. Go ahead. Are you are you okay with that, Dave? Yeah, sure, of course. 
have a couple questions uh, for the general fund, for the court specifically. Um, photo radar van revenue went down. Uh, that's expected. We we knew that was being eliminated. Uh, but can you let us know, because we were told that that was a cost, actually, right? So um, that 400-ish thousand, can, we, can you tell me where in the budget that, uh, where elsewhere in the budget the cost went down or were, re or, or were reallocated? That's a very complicated question because uh, costs get reallocated across the board as we develop the budget, right? So I, I, I'm not sure I have a good answer for you, um, but if you wanted to send us that question, we could do some research and give you a more thorough answer. So I don't think I could uh, just answer it right now. And and we do have some comparisons on, you know, where adjustments are, um, you know, department okay. by department. So I, I can give you that information, but it will take us some, some work to put it together. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll send that over. A couple other questions. Okay. Uh, through the, on the narrative, and I let me, if I remember, uh, I think page one forty eight talks about that the court expects BPD to increase photo radar tickets. However, when I look at the budget on page one forty seven, that shows significant decreases for those. So I, I, the narrative isn't matching the numbers. So I was wondering if if someone could comment on that. So I'll start and I um, can let the police department go ahead and chime in, but um, we're just concluding the RFP for the new service provider. So we may not have all that information available. And as um, Jenny said, we will be coming back to the council with a complete program and a supplemental request that should answer all your questions at that point in time as to fo what photo radar and how the program is going to move forward. Um, as far as the numbers that are in there right now, we would have, re you know, we don't necessarily know what that's going to bring. And what we try to put in the budget is what we know. And then once we have more information, we would bring that forward with the whole program. Yeah, yeah that's fair. It just doesn't match the narrative, right? If we're going to be increasing it, the numbers should reflect that. If we're gonna, if we're just showing being conservative in the numbers, like that makes sense. Um, uh, can I just add really quick on the Twitter sure. radar? There will be a little bit of a lag between when we implement it in the police department and the municipal court, just on the workflow. Sure. So the numbers in the municipal court um, reflect that. Okay, uh, and that that makes sense. Thank you, Susan. The court fines and forfeitures are down pretty significantly. Um, and and I didn't see that in the narrative anywhere. Can you tell me what's going on there? Down four hundred thousand from fiscal twenty three four fifty, down to one million is a pretty significant decrease. Um, I didn't see anything about that. Can someone explain that? Um, I don't know if Ron, if you're on board, if you can explain that because I don't know operationally. But again, I we could provide you that information if he's not on online to answer it. Okay. Yeah, if he's not, yeah, yeah. It just seems like when I look at this, um, revenue in fiscal twenty one was four point one eight six million in the court, uh, and last year was three point seven five. This year it's three million. I mean, we're seeing significant drops in revenue. At the same time, uh, costs have gone way up, as as we would expect, because we're offering a lot. But that represented a surplus in fiscal 21 of 200,000, uh, trans transforming to a deficit of 700,000 last year, uh, to a proposed deficit of 2 million this year. So I have I have concerns about this, and I'll submit my questions because I suspect as other budget committee members see this, though they might have concerns as well. But we'll need more more detailed information if we're going to accept a 2 million dollar budget deficit for one department. Uh, what's going on and when we could expect that to be um, fixed. So, Council Duggar. Uh, right. Council Duggar, this is Cecilia Lindstrom, your assistant city manager. And um, I know Judge Britton is on as well. Um, and uh, yes, I think uh, we are keeping an eye on that. Um, and we can provide you with follow-up data. As, as they were saying, it's, it's a complicated issue and um, uh, one that's not unique to our courts. Um, so, but let's follow up with you on that as as okay. uh, we're able to. Judge Britton, did you want to chime in with a little more for now? I can just say that um, we 
uh, towards the end of COVID did a big push. We were, we were playing catch up on fines and fees and enforcement of judgments because um, particularly in the beginning portion of COVID, we did, frankly didn't have staff <laughs> uh, in the office available to collect fines and fees from defendants and process the judgments. And so when we brought everyone back to the office, we really focused on kind of playing catch up with our cases. And so I think that's why you see that surge of fines and fees in, during that fiscal year. Um, and that continued even up until last year. Um, and then the second thing is our um, current vendor had the citations are down on the, the photo radar. And that's a complex issue. I, maybe the police can speak to that, but the filings are down, which I think reflects why we have uh, less collection of fines and fees, particularly on the traffic side of things. Thank you. Anything else, John? No, I think that was it for me. Okay, uh, Ashley, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, City Manager and Finance um, Director. Um, so I have some questions kind of about the contingency and re reserve. So I was just struggling to kind of understand when we were looking at the contingency and reserve schedules, there's a budgeted column and there's a proposed column. And in most cases, there's a difference in the amount. And I was trying to understand if um, the, like, was this like a requested versus what we actually are putting forward in the proposed budget? Or, you know, like, I wasn't understanding why, why there was such variation in those numbers. I'm going to let Susan go ahead and answer that. I mean, I suspect I know, but I, I wouldn't want to jump in on the technical side. Um, Councilor Hartmeyer Prig, what what page, do you have a specific page you were looking yeah. at? Yeah, so I'm like looking at like the whole like contingency and reserve schedule. So it's like across 24, 25, 26, 27. And like, I mean, for example, like repro graphics or um the information system systems, mm -hmm. information systems fund. Um, there's like, you know, kind of bigger differences between that budgeted column and that proposed column. And I, I'm just not understanding like what is the actual contingency? So that you're, you're looking was. at 24 budgeted versus mm -hmm. 25 proposed. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. the budget, the budgeted, and the labels of our um, of our software are not very clear. I apologize. So the budgeted column is for fiscal 24. That's the projected ending for the current fiscal year that we're in, and that's right. based on yeah. revenue estimates and expenditure estimates and how those funds will end the year. And then the proposed column, this label proposed, is the budget we're considering, the fiscal year 24-25 proposed. And that would be the ending fund balance that we're anticipating for fiscal 25. And mo a lot of these numbers are mathematically derived by various reserve schedules we have for our buildings and equipment or other types of policy targets. And then the undesignated or unreserved contingency uh, would be that amount that is available for un for unforeseen circumstances and, and cash flow needs that come up during the fiscal year. Okay. So then for example, um, let's look at the Bureau Central, Beaverton Central parking garage on page 28. Like last year we had a contingency of $356,000 and this year we only have a contingency of $54. And so I'm curious, is it just because like, you know, construction is done on that project? Is that why like a contingency like amount could be reduced to such a insignificant number. Right. And for this particular fund and Bureau in general, which um, the Bureau Budget Committee will meet, meet next week, Bureau is considered a closed system. And so the Bureau, um, there are other funds within the Bureau family that holds those contingencies. Okay. And this particular fund um, has reserve set-asides, but if there is an, an unforeseen circumstance in the parking fund, it can borrow from those contingent, not borrow, but it can receive those contingencies from the other bureau funds. Okay. Bureau is a, a, it's its own um, entity in terms of being able to use the contingencies of, within the family of funds. Okay, yeah, I mean that was just one example, but like in capital development fund on twenty five, we have a similar, you know, a few projects that had some decent contingency against against them and have none this year. So I was just trying to understand. Right. I mean, like right. Public Safety Center, Patricia Research Center for the Arts, we still have 
ongoing costs for those buildings. So I was just trying to understand that. Right. And for that fund, uh, those projects are planned to wrap up. So in theory, we would not need contingency for those okay. items in fiscal 25. Okay. Okay. That's really helpful. And yeah, thank you. I, I think the, because the software didn't tell me I was looking at two different years, that's where yes. I was like, these are so different. I don't understand what's going on here. So yes. thank you for Apologize that. for that confusion. No, no, that's okay. Um, okay. Let me just see. Um, generally, and this is something that I included in my feedback, but, you know, we've got some performance metrics in different funds. And Susan, this is not for you. This is probably more for department heads, right? When we're talking, you can stay on. I like seeing you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just that, like, I'm not going to ask you to answer this question. Um, just that, like, there's a couple different sets of performance indicators that we have in here that are really geared, like, towards the negative. And I think it's really important for us to, you know, if we're looking at like our um, our police performance indicators and we have things that talk about like wanting to have a higher amount of arrests or a higher amount of DUIs, not wanting, but like that we, ex we anticipate them. And given that like we want these goals of like community safety and building trust between the PD and the city and the residents and everything, I think it's important for us to be looking for performance indicators that like are moving us towards those goals of safety, right? And if we have more arrests or more DUIs, that I don't know that that's trending towards safety. And Chief, I'm not meaning to pick on you. It's just those are the ones that like I have fresh on my mind, right? Um, so I, I, and I think in like, in a law enforcement um, area, it's more natural for us to see that type of a performance indicator, you know, of being more vague about enforcement activities. But I think when we've got really great goals around public safety, it would just be really great to see performance indicators maybe be more around like, hey, our community engagement events, that's the indicator this year. And we're going to increase that because that is like how we're going to really build that meaningful trust in our community. So that was just kind of a general sentiment that I have across the performance indicators. It's hard for me to like see this massive investment in our city, right? Our budget is large. Um, and then to have like negative performance indicators, right? I want to like, I'm hoping that like, because we know that this is a, a reflection of like how we want Beaverton to be, I want, our, I would love to see our performance indicators also move in that way. So more of a comment than a question, but just something I want to call out. Could I touch on that, uh, counselor? <clears throat> just just for perspective, and and I I hear what you're saying about maybe being a little bit broader with our performance objectives. Um, the one specific around DUI enforcement um, is directly tied and related to uh, safety for the community. Um, as you know, DUI enforcement is is a large portion of of the responsibility of keeping our roadways safe for family members. And I'll get on a soapbox for a minute. Uh, more people die at the hands of DUI drivers than uh, almost any other crime in the nation. And um, over 215 people in Oregon last year lost their lives at the hands of someone that was under the influence driving. Um, and so to us, that is a performance measure to take impaired drivers out of our community and off our roadways. So when we talk about that being an objective to arrest folks that are driving impaired, it is because it's it creates safety for the entire community. And sadly, Oregon ranks 13th in the nation for the most impaired driving fatalities. So that's what that metrics comes from. Thank you, Chief, for the explanation. Kevin, you are next. Yeah, I'll keep it short because most of what I was going to say has been either spoken or answered, but I was going to follow up on what Councillor Duggar was sharing about the photo radar cameras. Um, and I had a similar concern and um, was able to talk with uh, Judge Britton and, and Rod Richards and and their answer was really good. So if they want to just share out a similar answer via email uh, or summary response, that would be great. But basically it was just transition and the timing of the new technology and adjusting to the new contract would see a dip in this first year. But as the tech ramps back up and as we get in the flow of it, um, we'll see more revenue coming in from that. So that really satisfied me, but uh, Judge Britton or Ron, if there's more information you all wanna share via the written summary, that could be helpful for some people. We can provide that follow-up uh, in writing if that would be best for the committee. 
So judge, if you want to send that to um, Susan and myself, then we can disseminate it. Great. All right. I believe I only have a couple more slides on the library. So well, I have one more, one more okay. comment. Um, I was going to ask you. This more. is a very small comment. Um, on page seventy-six, someone asked the question about the hundred six dollar, hundred six thousand dollar special expense and professional services number. Um, and one of the, and this is a very small thing. One of the things was a Future Connect program, scholarships for students, uh, that goes to uh, PCC. Um, I would only suggest. I think we should keep it. Uh, I think the scholarships are important, but I don't think um, we should tie it necessarily to PCC, given the low enroll uh, graduation rates uh, of PCC and uh, the low rates of uh, completion of the students, which is about 30%. Uh, and uh, it, it just seems silly to give money away to people, 30% uh, of which of, of whom are, are only going to finish the, the, the project. So. Um, and the overall graduation rate at PCC is 15%, uh, which is really quite horrible. Um, I would give the scholarships away, but let the people choose where they want to go. They could go to PCC, but they also could go to Portland State, for example, uh, which has a graduation rate of uh, around 65% or so, or they could go to any number of places uh, that the money would allow them to go to. So just, just a suggestion. Uh, Nadia. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just have two comments. One, if we can get the PowerPoints before the meeting, that would be fabulous. Um, mm -hmm. It's easier just for me to track on my end. Um, I did just want to follow up to your comment, Chair. Um, I believe the money goes to Future Connect, and so the graduation rate of Portland Community College is not applicable because it's like specific funding that goes to specific programs to help those students graduate. And I would imagine that that rate is actually different. And I'm sure we can find someone to pull it if that helps. Thanks. Well, it, it, is, it is higher. It's 30% versus 15%. Uh, but most universities or colleges do have uh, the ability to help students get through a program, especially low income students um, or first generation students. At any rate, um, why don't we, uh, well, here, here's a comment from Chris Campbell. Uh, Chris, are you on line here? I was just commenting to know that can it, can it also go to kids with, who are seeking trade versus college? I, I don't know. Yeah, so we should look at that data to figure out how many kids are going into trade versus college. If the, low, if the, low, if the rate is low, maybe because that's the reason why. Maybe there's an increase in trades and there's any help in that area. Okay, and, and uh, 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 John mentioned that we should avoid policy discussion and stick to the budget, which is good advice, John. Thank you. Um, uh, Edward, you had uh, a question. Yes, thank you. Um, just comment that I love to see that you replenish the budget for uh, program director for DEI, equity officer uh, office and um, one thing I want to request to city manager or whomever is that um, I have never seen a details of the council budget before. What I'm saying is there's um, big headlines like um, um, community service designated contributions or materials and services and professional services. Uh, can you possibly uh, send me some details of how those money was spent? Just wondering because our budget, but I've never seen how it's spent. Yes, absolutely. We'll get that to you. Thank you. Okay, any other thoughts before we go on to the library fund? Debbie, the library fund. <laughs> All right. Let me open that. Okay. Uh, so, library fund. Let's see if it'll work. Um, so, Again, showing you the revenues and expenditures, and I have one thing in the way uh, for the library fund. So overall, when you you look at the library fund, you know we have a, the re total revenues, and I don't know why I didn't put the total revenues on there, but it is on the next page. So we'll go there. 
So you can see a comparison of um, what our revenues were for last fiscal year um, at $12.4 million. And you can see that it, this year it's $12.9 million. Um, that is specifically an increase in the overall taxes um, that the city's providing. Uh, you can see the WCCLS, there's a uh, what we were told was about a 1% increase. It may be 2%. So there might be an additional $65,000 coming in from WCCLS um, once they make that final decision. And the rest of those um, revenues are fairly small. Uh, so we do have an interfund transfer in. Um, it's less than last year, but um, this is the money from the opioid settlement fund that will um, support the, um, the work that they do in the library. Um, and overall, you can see that our expenses are again, trending that $500,000 higher, which is primarily in the personnel services and transfers out to other funds, um, which would primarily be the, be the building fund um, because there's a separate fund for the building um, maintenance work that, um, does the library. So this overall budget reduces small portions of FTEs funded um, through September. So as you recall, I talked about the general fund, that 0.17 FTE was the residual FTE for a portion of people that was, those were removed out of this budget. Um, it eliminates one um, library assistant position and a half of a program coordinator position but it adds a half FTE to that building monitor to make it full-time. And it retains all current programming and hours. Overall, the library financial forecast continues, as we know, it continues to have a structural deficit. This chart really shows how we have been um, below our, uh, our fund balance target. We're below it every year. Um, we're working to get it up a little bit, um, but it's, it's very difficult um, to maintain all the programming. Uh, those, those, the fund balance is really important to make sure that we can handle unforeseen circumstances that come up. And the library levy is coming due for a vote. And so we are continuing to monitor this, um, this fund very closely. So that is the end of what I have for you today. Thank you, Debbie. Are there any questions about the library fund? Kevin. This isn't so much a question right now, but more for people who are listening to this um, who might not be following as much. There is a study underway with WCCLS uh, about countywide library funding. And as that gets ironed out, that should, well, hopefully, help us out a little bit. So there's still more details to come, but we're trying to address that in partnership with the county too. So stay tuned. Any other thoughts or comments, ideas on the library fund? Edward. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we have discussed this before, but um, the Shoals Ferry and Murray Library uh, has seen um, patrons or library goers from Tiger, there's expansion of uh, uh, South Cooper Mountain area and also 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 overlaps Tiger. Um, and they see a lot more people coming, not just our city residents. Um, when you talk to WCCLS, um, I, I was just wondering what are your conversations like um, that I think it should be funded more. And so far, um, are we able to talk about it? Somebody answer that question. Hi, Councilor Kim, um, Seal Lindstrom, your assistant city manager, and I invite um, Kim Carroll, our library director, to to come on for this as well. Um, we have uh, just started the process, as as Councilor Teeter mentioned. We've started just started the process 
um, working with Washington County to assess um, the kind of service levels and um, some of the things that you're talking about um, are part of the larger conversation about governance and funding. And so we'll continue to do the deep dive into that as we're going along, because you're right, um, part of this is not just looking at where we are now, but um, projecting forward where we're going to be as a community and how do we anticipate um, where services are going to be most needed. Kim, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll just second that, that, uh, you know, service areas is, is, is the city of Beaverton and also the surrounding area of Washington County that we serve. All of the libraries in Washington County serve unincorporated residents, and that's part of that equity lens that they're looking at for this funding and governance project. So we'll be seeing, like, talk about service area and what the impacts and implications are of the funding formula that moves forward, I would say. Thank you. Are there any other thoughts, questions on the library fund? That is our last agenda item for today. So does anyone want to move to adjourn? One thing before we adjourn. Okay. Um, so I know we covered a lot of information tonight and I wanna make sure that your questions are answered as we go into the next meeting next week. So um, send your questions to us early so we can get you a nice thorough response. Um, you feel free to um, to call or, or email us with those. And we would like to make sure that the entire committee has those um, answers hopefully before the next meeting. So. If you have questions, please send them our way so that we can get them answered and you guys can all get the information you need to um, to deliberate next week. Thank you, Debbie. Mm -hmm. um, any, someone said, if you can share the PowerPoints beforehand, Nadia, if you can share the PowerPoints beforehand, that would help as well. Um, we will try our best, but I can tell you we're doing those right up until the start of the meeting and you have a week to put together all the information for the next PowerPoint. So um, I'll try my best to get it to you maybe the day before. It's okay, even because as you're going through, it's it's helpful to just be able to go back when you're talking. So that just helps me. But thank you. Appreciate it. Totally understand that. And chair, you don't need a motion to adjourn. It is totally within your your authority as the chair to adjourn the meeting. Oh, well, then we are adjourned. <laughs> Thank Good you night, so everyone. much.